for tonight. We're here in Joshua chapter 7. Let me pray and then we'll jump right into this chapter together. Lord, we thank you that you are with us tonight because your word tells us where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. So we thank you that you're here tonight. And we thank you for the people who have come from different places around the country to be baptized. And we just pray that the whole night from the worship to the time in your word to the time after baptizing people will bring you much glory and honor, Lord. We thank you for, your, for the work that you're doing to change hearts and lives. We thank you, Lord, for your patience with us, your love toward us. And we pray as we look into this chapter tonight that you'll speak to us from the pages of Scripture. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We honor you in every way. We exalt you in this place. You are worthy of our praise. Be exalted here, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, for those of you who are new, I want to orient you with a map because we're going to be looking at a new location in chapter 7. So this is uh, a a satellite view of Israel, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea connected by the Jordan River. And uh, the Israelites have made their way from slavery out of Egypt. They've come up underneath the southern end of the Dead Sea to the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Now they're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They've settled in a place called Shittim, uh, which translates Acacia Grove. And they're going to cross the Jordan River at this location. They're going to end up going to a, a small community called Gilgal. And from there, they will launch a military campaign against the city of Jericho. We'll talk a little bit about that again tonight because it relates to where we are in chapter 7. But the conquering of Jericho was chapter 6. And then following Jericho, they're going to take the next city, which is the city of Ai. And that's all here in chapter 7. So that's where we are on the map. That's where we are here in our Bibles in Joshua chapter 7. And if you look at verse 1, it says, but the children, notice but, it's not good when you begin a chapter like that. <laughs> but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So pause there for just a moment, uh, because I want to talk about two quick things from, those first, from that first verse. One, that they committed a trespass. What is that? And the accursed things... Uh, what is that? So there are three typical words used in the Old Testament, used really throughout the Bible, but I'm going to share with you the Hebrew of the Old Testament related to offenses against God. Those three common words in your English Bibles are sin, iniquity, and transgressions. Those three words are different Hebrew words. The word sin in Hebrew is chata. Chata means to miss the mark. It's when you don't measure up to the standard of God. That's sin. We all fall short of that standard of God, right? The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's another word. The word for iniquity in the Hebrew is avon. It's spelled the same way as avon cosmetics too, by the way. I'm do they still sell Avon? Is that still a product today? All right. So if, you, if you're using Avon, you're smearing iniquity all over your face. But anyway, <laughs> just giving you the Hebrew. I'm, it's, I'm sure it's a wonderful company. I'm just giving you the Hebrew. So Avon, translated, spelled the same way, A-V-O-N, means iniquity. And iniquity, Avon translates bent or twisted. And it speaks about the, the twisted um, moral uh, problem of the human heart that the character is, our character is bent. We are born in iniquity. We are born in sin. And thus, because we are bent, we have a natural propensity towards sin. So that's iniquity. Sin, iniquity. And the last word that is often used in the Bible to describe offenses against God is transgression. And that's the Hebrew word uh, pesha. And that uh, word transgression means a willful, deliberate disobedience against God. That's where God draws a line and we intentionally step over it. So these are three different words used in the Bible, sin, iniquity, and transgression. And they mean three different types of offenses against God. What's interesting is the word used here in chapter 7 verse 1 is not any of those three. When it talks here about how Israel committed a trespass, it is the Hebrew word ma'al. 
And ma'al means uh, to act covertly, to act covertly. And within the word covert is the word cover, because that is the real meaning of this word. The trespass that the nation of Israel is guilty of is covering over their sin, their offense against God. This, the, you're going to see here in chapter 7, if you're unfamiliar with the story, that what God told them not to do, one individual did and literally covered it up, hid it, and it became a secret sin. That's this word here, trespass, a secret sin against God. I want you to notice that it says Israel committed a trespass, even though it was only one individual. And it relates to the rest of the chapter, but I'll unpack it as we go forward. The other thing I wanted to point out there, as I mentioned, is that the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. What exactly is that a reference to, the accursed things? So if you weren't here last week, we need to be reminded of this, or if you weren't here, to be informed of it. So go back to chapter 6 for a minute, because I want to read verses 17 to 19. Because when the children of Israel were told by God to take the city of Jericho, they were given a strict warning. When you take the city of Jericho, you are not to touch the things within the city with the exception of the silver, gold, and bronze, and that is to go into the treasury of the Lord. Everything else, including man, woman, and child, was to be killed, and everything within that city was not to be touched because it's all considered accursed. So back in chapter 6, verse 17 says, Now the city shall be doomed. This is about Jericho. The city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab, here's an exception, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated it's a different word, Kadesh, sacred, to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And then jump down to verse 21, where it says, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. So what happens here back in chapter 7 is we're going to find that this one individual who's named there in verse 1, Achan, has gone against the Lord's command, and he's actually taken some things from the city, and he has hidden them. He has taken some of the plunder, some of the things that God says, this is a curse, do not touch it, do not take it. The only exception was you were to rescue Rahab and her family, take her and her family, and you were to take the silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and take that into the treasury of the Lord. Everything else is to be destroyed or left there. Now, I want to just mention briefly, because I get this a lot, and I've been getting emails, like, this is difficult for some people when you look at what happened in, in, in Jericho in chapter 6, you're going to see what happens in successive towns that the Israelites take when they conquer the promised land, that this seems to be, and this is where even liberal theo the theologians will say, what is happening here is this, is this is the equivalent of a Christian holy war. This is not a Christian holy war. But I do want to talk briefly about the ethical dilemma of war. And I'm going to give you four points, but this is not the ethical dilemma of all wars. This is just the ethical dilemma of war as it relates to God commanding the Israelites to strike down these cities and to kill all within them or to not touch the articles within these cities. And so there are four quick points I just want to mention here, and then we're going to move on. But I think this is important because we have to have a, a proper framework and understanding of what is behind God's command here. Number one, God is sovereign over all the earth. This is Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, all who live in it. Everything about the earth is the Lord. So he's sovereign over everything. And because he is sovereign over everything and everyone, it is his prerogative as it relates to every single life. Like it or not, he is sovereign over life. The only reason you and I have breath in our lungs tonight is because of the grace of God. God gives life, God takes life away, God preserves life in between. 
So he's sovereign over all the earth. Number two, it's important to realize in the framework of of biblical history that God chose a people and a place to unfold his plan of redemption for mankind. This is Genesis 15, 18. The people were the Jews. The place was the land of Israel. And God promised a people through the seed of Abraham. He promises this to Abraham. You will have descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And God also promised to Abraham a place where those people could live for the purpose of ultimately producing a Messiah that would come from that race of people. And so God prescribed for them even the title deed of the land and the borders of the land right there in Genesis 15, 18, from the great river, the Nile, to the great river, the Euphrates, the land in between, was to belong to these particular people that would emerge from the seed of Abraham. This would be their particular place to live because God was implementing a redemptive plan for mankind, and he did it through a people in a place. Everybody with me so far? But what happens is the people that were opposed to God occupied the place. And so, number three, God was patient with the pagan people who had occupied this place until, it says, that their sin had reached its full measure. That's Genesis 15, 16. But when they did not repent, God judged them and brought his people back to their place. And so God is patient with everybody, but there is a limit to God's patience. How long was he patient with the Amorites, the pagan people who lived in the land of Canaan? 400 years. You know, don't tell God how long is is, is long enough. I mean, 400 years. I mean, even that he would be gracious with us for a day is is a testament to to his mercy. The fact that he's patient for 400 years is an incredible testament to his patience and his mercy. But the Amorite people did not turn, the Canaanite people did not turn. Despite the fact that they knew he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew he was the God of miracles because Rahab's own testimony in chapter six tells us that she knew and the people, her people knew that God was God and Lord of the universe and yet they refused to repent. And so, God is going to bring his own people, the Jewish people, back into that land that he promised on oath to Abraham, and he's going to displace the people who were there. And why is he going to do all this? Last point, number four, because God testified to the surrounding nations that he alone is God. This is Exodus 7, 5, and we see it repeated in Joshua 4, 24. What do I mean? Pagan nations were under the illusion that their gods, small g, were true and powerful. And so in order for God to reveal himself, because he loves all people of all nations, not just the Jewish people, he had to display his power and his might by confronting these false gods among these nations that worshiped these false gods. That's the first thing he did in Exodus chapter seven, verse five. Through a series of 10 plagues, God says that the Egyptians might know that I am the Lord. See, he loved the Egyptian people too. He didn't just love his own people, the Hebrew people, to deliver them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. He loved the Egyptian people, too, that through a display of 10 various plagues, which, by the way, when you look at Egyptian history, each of the 10 plagues that God implemented confronted one of the 10 false gods of the Egyptians. Every single plague that God implemented was a confrontation of the false gods of the Egyptians so that the Egyptians would know their gods aren't real, their gods aren't powerful. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who is powerful. And Exodus 7, 5 says this. God did this to display his power that all nations would know that he is God. Well, now the people of Israel get into the promised land and God still has the same objective. Look at the end of chapter 4 of Joshua. Just go back a couple of chapters to chapter 4 and and look at the last verse, verse 24. Why was he doing all this? Why was he displaying himself among these pagan nations, having to use a very, uh, you know, bold and harsh and... and, um, you know, eye-opening approach because, last verse of chapter 4, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. 
And so the, the aspect of war is difficult for us, but we need to understand in perspective of God's redemptive plan, he wanted to return a people to a place that he promised on oath. From that place, among those people would emerge a Messiah to save the whole world. And because after 400 years, the people who occupied that land thumbed a nose at God, God then judged them. And it is per his prerogative to judge those who have refused him and rejected him. And as much as we don't like bloodshed and war and we don't like all of this, you know, terrible slaughter here, this in the end is to display that he's a serious God who is just and he is merciful to all who call upon him, like Rahab and her family. She's a picture of all of us. But that he will not be patient forever. There is a limit to God's patience. And we need to all understand this. There is a day of judgment for everybody. Now, for those of us in Christ, we pass from death to life. There's therefore now no condemnation. Our judgment is on the cross. But otherwise, everybody on earth will be judged in some way, shape, or form. You're either judged by the cross and receive his mercy, or you deny the cross and you will receive his justice. I would much rather have his mercy. Amen. So... That's a little bit about the ethical dilemma of war, and I, and I wanted to just, you know, highlight that because of where we are in all of this. So, what we have here back in chapter 7, 1, is Achan, who acts sinfully by taking some of the, some of the uh, accursed things that are in the city of, of, uh, of Jericho, and so it's going to come back to haunt them. Uh, if I had a title for um, this chapter, it would be Mistaken Aiken. <laughs> and if you know how the chapter ends, which hopefully we'll get to, it could really be called Mistaken Aiken Fried Like Bacon. <laughs> but bacon's not kosher, so maybe that title won't do. We'll look at verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not, do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. All right, now note, these are the first casualties among the Israelis. And they're not used to losing, because every step along the way, God has been with them, and God has demonstrated His powerful hand. So that's why their hearts have melted, because they are seeing defeat for the first time and 36 casualties of war. And so it says in verse 6, then Joshua tore his clothes. That's a sign of grieving and, and mourning. He tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. That's all just a sign of grief and mourning. Verse 7, and Joshua said, so now he's praying, watch this, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So Joshua has no idea why they've suffered defeat. And by the way, when we get to the end of the chapter, if we have time, um, I'm, I'm going to share four quick lessons from Achan. So when we get to the end, don't think he's done because I'm, I'm not going to be done. I got four quick points, but I'm going to summarize them when we get to the end. But I want you to notice with me at this point, Joshua has no idea why they've been defeated. But he's grieving before God. He doesn't know what's happened. Uh, you know, we don't find out till a little bit later. So, so he has no idea. He's pleading before God. He's on his face before God. He's, you know, torn his clothes, got dust all over his head and stuff. And he's, and he's asking something that we typically do. Why, God, have you allowed this? Oh, 
as if God is responsible. So watch the Lord's response in in verse uh, 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Don't you love that? Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, this is all God speaking to Joshua. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who was taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Wow. This is God saying to Joshua, this is the reason why you've experienced defeat. So instead of asking me, why have you done this or allowed this to happen, get up off your face, you got a problem in the camp. So now Joshua realizes what's going on. But they are going to have to figure out who it is through a process of elimination. And so God prescribes it. He outlines it right there. I want you to bring out tribes among the 12 tribes of Israel, and then I'm going to select which is the one of the 12 tribes. And out of those tribes, I'm going to tell you which is the right family. And out of the families, I'm going to tell you which is the right household. And out of the household, there's one man. I'm going to expose it bit by bit. So the next day, verse 16, so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Now, it doesn't tell us, by the way, the process by which the right tribe and family and household and man is discerned. It is believed that they are using, this is again, you know, this is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You don't get to that until Acts chapter 2. So prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, how did man discern the, the will of God? Well, one of the things that they would rely on was something that the priests, the high priest, would carry in his vestment two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim were two stones by which they would discern the will of God. And, that, and God was providentially involved in the use of the Urim and Thummim. So a priest had a vestment, and he had a pocket within the vestment, and there were two stones they, it is believed of different colors. One was the Urim, which meant curse uh, or, or guilt, and the other was Thummim, which meant uh, innocent or faultless. It was basically no and yes. Uh, and so these two stones would be inside the vestment, and then when the people of Israel needed to discern some major decision, they would pray, ask the Lord, and then the priest would pull out a stone, and if it was the Urim, that meant cursed, no, not, don't do it. If it was the Thummim, it meant innocent, faultless, that was the affirmative, yes, go ahead. So that's what is believed as being used here, but we don't, we don't know. It could simply be Joshua prays, and as he prays, the Lord reveals it to him. We don't know exactly by what method it is used to discern here, but we do know that it is discerned uh, bit by bit. Uh, through the tribes, through the families, through the households, and then by man. So, so again, verse 10, verse uh, uh, 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning, brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. So out of the 12, Judah was taken. So he, he kind of segregates Judah now from the rest. Verse 17. And he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites. And he brought the family of the Zarites, man by man. And Zabdi was taken, 
And then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Let me ask you a question. What do you think was going through Achan's mind through that whole process? You're standing with, you know, a multitude of tens of thousands of people, and then through discernment, it is announced, it's the tribe of Judah. All the rest of you can go home. And, you know, you're Achan. You're like, yeah, I'm in the tribe of Judah. And so then the tribe of Judah's left. And then the next, you know, family is called out, and Achan's like, yeah, that's my family. And then the next household, yeah, that's my household. I mean, you know, he's standing there realizing by now, no doubt, that he's about to be exposed here. And I think this is an important, why would God do this little by little instead of just saying, Joshua, it's Achan, I'm, I'm telling you right now, and deal with him. I'm going to tell you why. I believe God is doing it incrementally like this, but hold on, let's, let's look at the rest of the passage. Verse 19, and now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, and he said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils, this is in Jericho, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. Circle that. I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So the guy stole this stuff, took it as plunder, you know, in the midst of the chaos there as they take Jericho, takes it, brings it back to his tent, digs a hole and buries it. You know, listen, if you have to bury the stuff, what good is it anyway? I mean, he's never going to, when in the world would, he, world would he ever be able to bring out that Babylonian robe and go, check it out, it was on sale. No. <laughs> Everybody's going to look at it and go, uh, excuse me, where did you get that? And how all of a sudden has he become wealthy with his silver and gold? By the way, in today's dollars, the weight of the shekels here and of silver and of gold, it's about five pounds of silver. So I looked up what, what it's silver is going for per ounce today. This is about $2,200 worth of silver in today's dollars. And um, the amount of gold that he stole is about a pound and a quarter of gold, which comes out to about $38,000. In today's dollars, the co combination is about 40 grand, $40,000 and a Babylonian robe. And you're going to die over this. Like the things that we do because we covet that end up destroying us. It's not worth it. It's just, it's just never worth it. And so it says in verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? Do you know Achan's name, Achan, in Hebrew means troubler? This is a play on words. He's like, Achan, you are living up to your name. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are born Achan, which means troubler. I don't know what parent would name their child that, but they did. And he said, and now you have brought trouble on us. And he says, the Lord will trouble you this day. And so all Israel stoned him with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And then they raised, they raised over him a great heap of stones still there to this day. And so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor, to this day, Achor, the same root word for Achan. And so four things real quickly, lessons from, from Achan. Number one, secret sin is no secret to God. Right? Secret sin is no secret to God. Joshua may not have originally known what Achan did. Nobody else in Israel may have necessarily known what Achan did. Maybe even Mrs. Achan didn't know what Achan did, but God knew what Achan did. 
He can smuggle it into his tent, bury it, and hide it, but nothing is hidden from God. Everything about our lives is in full view of God. In Hebrews 4.13, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In Psalm 33, 13 to 15, it says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. That's Psalm 33, 13 to 15. Proverbs 5, 21 says, For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. So there is no secret sin with God. He sees it all. Number two. Secret sin affects others besides you. All throughout this chapter, it was written in the plural, even though the offense was committed by a singular person. Israel this, Israel that, they this, they that. Because the ramifications spill over into the lives of others around us, secret sin does not only affect ourselves. A teen secretly doing things, sinfully hiding from mom and dad, will affect that relationship. A husband cheating on a wife, a wife cheating on a husband will affect the relationship, even while it's still secret. An employee secretly stealing from the company that will affect it in the long run. Rarely is our unconfessed sin something that only affects ourselves. There are ramifications for people around us. This is the whole story of chapter 7. Number three. This is an important one. Secret sin makes us more vulnerable to the enemy. The Israelites got trounced by the people of Ai because there was secret sin in the camp. God's favor and protection are extended to his children as we walk in obedience. But when we walk in disobedience, how can we expect the favor and protection of the Lord? The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Next verse, 1 Peter 5, 9 says, resist him standing firm in the faith. We can't really be standing firm in the faith if we are not living in obedience to the Lord. So how can we expect his protection from the enemy? They suffered defeat here because of unconfessed sin. It's important for us to understand it goes hand in hand. And then lastly, number four, Secret sin can either stay unconfessed and get uncovered or get confessed and stay covered. Now, what do I mean by this? Here's where I think this process of elimination expresses to us really what was the mercy of God. I'm convinced that the reason why God just didn't name Achan from the beginning and expose him, because God knows all things, he knew exactly who was guilty, was because he was giving these incremental steps as an opportunity for at any moment for Achan to step up and say, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to tell you right now, it was me. And I, I don't have anything other than, you know, other, a few other comparative things in the Bible to, to say this definitively, so, so we don't really know, but I believe that Achan's life could have been spared. You know, when, when Hezekiah was uh, dying and Isaiah the prophet went to him and said, there's a death sentence on your life, get your house in order. The Lord has determined that you're going to die. And it says that Hezekiah turned to the wall and wept and prayed to God and God extended his life. So even where there's the sentence of God, there can be the mercy of God if we turn. And I'm convinced that the reason why God went tribe by tribe clan by clan, family by family, household by household, man by man, was to give time for Achan to step up and to confess before he was exposed. And I think if we do that, then God will cover. Not cover, not cover up, okay? God is not interested in covering up things like covertly. But the Bible talks about how he covers over our offenses, how his forgiveness covers over our offenses. Let me give them to you. In Proverbs 28, 13, first, it tells us how unconfessed sin can get uncovered. 
In Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Okay, that's Proverbs 28, 13. Now listen to this, Proverbs, uh, Psalm 32. This is David praying a prayer of confession in Psalm 32, 1 to 5. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. There's the word right there in the Bible. That when we come clean with God, He covers over our sin. We don't have to be embarrassed by it. Because He, he covers it with the blood of His Son, Jesus. He forgives us and He imparts to us His mercy and His grace because we come clean to Him. When we don't come clean, then He exposes it. And it's much more painful. But David says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David says, when I kept silent... When I kept it covered, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand, Lord, was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. But I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 85 verse 2 says something very similar. You, Lord, have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. This is good news for us. It doesn't have to be humiliating and embarrassing. When we go to the Lord and we confess our sin, listen, this is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can choose to have our sin unconfessed and it'll get exposed. Or we can come clean with God, confess our sins, and he covers it by the blood of Jesus Christ and he forgives us. So this is the merciful hand of God. I think Achan had a chance here. It could have gone very differently for him had he just come clean and acknowledged his sin before the Lord. How about right now as we close in prayer so that we can get to the baptisms that we just ask the Lord, check our hearts right now. Is there any unconfessed sin, Lord, that we need to confess with to you right now so that you would cover over it with the blood of your son, Jesus, and forgive me? Lord, this is your word. We see the example of Achan here. We see how tragic things turned out for him and his family. What a strong, sobering statement of your judgment upon someone who just never stepped forward to confess or to own his sin. We thank you, Lord, for your grace now. We thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ, that if we confess our sin to you, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't want there to be secret sin in our lives, Lord. We don't want there to be unconfessed sin. We want to be right with you. We want to confess those things. So right now, Lord, point anything out in our lives right now that we need to hear from you. And I'm just going to pause in my prayer and just allow us just to have a moment of silence and just ask the Lord, Lord, it's, it, I mean, it's likely that we already know, but if for some reason we have a blind spot to it, would you just ask him, Lord, reveal it to me right now. What are things in my own life that have gone unconfessed? And if he shows you something, then just follow through right now and say, Lord, I, I acknowledge my sin. I confess my sin to you. I pray for your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, for your cleansing work in my life. I pray for a fresh outpouring of your grace. Lord, I don't want to return to this sin. I want to be free of it. So I renounce it. I repent of it. And I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness right now. I receive it. I receive your forgiveness. Shower me with your grace, Lord. I want to obey you, Lord. I want to walk in faithfulness. Thank you for loving me, Lord. Father, you've heard our prayers. We thank you that you're gracious and loving and 
patient with us, wanting none to perish but all to come to repentance. May we learn from the example of Achan, Lord, in our own lives to deal seriously with sin, to not walk in transgression before you. And when prompted by the Holy Spirit about areas of our lives that are not right with you, may we be obedient right there to confess, to repent, to surrender that area of our own lives to you so that bit by bit, we will be fully surrendered to you. This is our prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.